I'm just going to kick off, if that's okay, um, and get going. Um, just in the interest of time, I am terrible for uh, waffles, so <laughs> I don't want to waffle too much and end up running over. I know there's some really nice sessions after this one, so hopefully everyone can hear slash see everything that I've got to present. I can't see now, so <laughs> keep it my fingers crossed. Um, but for anyone who hasn't guessed so far, um, I'm Ian. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, managing mental health, kind of my own mental health journey, um, specifically uh, my own mental health journey as a cisgendered man um, in this world. And that's why I've kind of entitled this Managing Mental Health in a Man's World. I've very, very purposefully used inverted commas. Um, this is not by any stretch of the imagination targeted solely at uh, cisgendered men or, or people who do identify as men. There are things in here that are applicable to anyone, no matter how you identify. So please do stick around. Please don't be put off by the fact that I've said man's world. Um, I promise you there will be something in here, hopefully, that you find useful or interesting. Importantly, uh, I do want to kick off with um, a trigger warning. Um, we're going to be touching on some themes around anxiety and depression and stress. Um, I'm also going to briefly uh, discuss uh, suicide um, and discuss my own kind of experiences with therapy as well. Um, and I'm also going to talk around some of my experiences with uh, coming out as a gay man. Um, I'm not going to be dwelling on any of these for too long, but I just thought it was really, really uh, important to get those in there right from the top. Followed by a cat picture, obviously. Um, so just a real quick introduction so you can really get to know me. Um, I promise I won't dwell on this for too long, but I'm Ian, as I've definitely already said. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I live in Leeds, which is in the north of England, for anyone who doesn't know, with my boyfriend and my cat, Lulu. Here she is looking majestic AF in the sun last summer. Controversially, I'm actually a dog person and I've got two dogs uh, who live back at my mum's house, but the cat doesn't know that, so it's fine. I work in digital PR and SEO, which for anyone who doesn't know what that means, basically companies pay me to get them into the press and then to get people to link to their website so that Google can rank it. Around four years ago now, I had a stress and anxiety induced mental breakdown and I put myself into therapy. Um, I also love yoga. I am going to start my yoga teacher training next month. Um, I love drag in all of its many, many forms. And I'm obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer as well. Uh, for anyone who's wondering, I've just started rewatching season five for maybe the thousandth time, arguably the best season, but that's a whole other presentation. So why am I here uh, today talking to people I've never met on the internet about my mental health? Well, I genuinely believe that at the moment we're seeing a real kind of turning point for uh, mental health worldwide, um, definitely in the UK, but worldwide for sure. Um, we've kind of on one hand got almost record numbers of people dealing with mental health issues. On the other hand, we've got an increasing number of people who are more and more willing to speak out about their experiences and uh, talk openly about their mental health issues and that's kind of creating almost a level of comfort around talking about mental health which is where we need to be. I've got a few facts and stats to run through. I promise you that this is the only slide that you will see that rattles off stats in bullet points like this but I feel like they're important to get in so bear with. I could reel off endless ones. I've limited it to five. Um, so why am I here? Well, one in four people will experience some kind of mental health issue every single year in England. One in four people. That's huge when you put that into perspective. In any given week, eight in 100 people will experience a mixture of anxiety and depression. People who identify as LGBTQ plus are at an increased risk of developing anxiety disorders. Male suicide risks are also at a two decade high. Last year, they were the highest they have been for 20 years. And in 2019, men accounted for three quarters of all deaths by suicide. 75% of all deaths by suicide were men in 2019. So you can see kind of the, the state of play here. And like I said, I think we're at a real turning point this year. Ultimately, why I'm here talking to you today is that I genuinely believe in my heart of hearts 
that open and honest conversation is our best weapon in breaking down the stigmas that surround mental health. The more that we can all talk to each other and our loved ones quite openly about the way that we're feeling, the more that we remove that stigma. And the more that we remove that stigma, the more likely people are to speak out when they're struggling and seek the help that they need. And the more people seek the help that they need, the more lives can be saved, ultimately. So that's why I'm here. I am here to talk and to show that there is nothing wrong with talking about having mental health battles. So what's my story so far? What got me to, to this point, standing in front of my laptop, uh, speaking to strangers on the internet about my mental health? Well, I have dealt with stress and anxiety probably for most of my life, really, um, certainly for kind of as long as I can remember. But it's only in very recent years that I've been able to kind of identify and articulate that that's what it is, that it is stress and it is anxiety that, that I've been dealing with. It's only in the past maybe three to four years, um, well, probably more recently, even probably two to three years, that I've actually become comfortable in speaking out and saying when I need help and talking about how I'm feeling. I went for a long, long time thinking that that was the worst thing you could possibly do, asking for help, which we'll get onto in a second. Um, as a child, I um, experienced some, some pretty major childhood traumas. Um, it culminated in uh, losing my dad to suicide when I was 11 years old. Shortly after that, I came to the kind of realization that I was also gay, um, which at the time was the worst possible thing that I thought could happen to me. I, I was completely not okay with that, um, which led to me carrying around some real serious um, sort of internalized homophobia and self-hatred for a very long time as I came to terms with my sexuality. Thankfully, um, I'm surrounded by incredible people. It was all fine years down the line, but you know, 12, 13 year old me, this was just the worst possible thing that could have happened. So kind of coming right off the bat, of losing my dad um, and going through that kind of trauma to then heading into this spiral of self-hatred. Um, my teenage years probably didn't start off in, in the best possible way. And thinking back to 11 year old me, I have one very, very vivid memory from my dad's funeral. Um, and that was this, that was being told uh, by someone who was there who probably had the, the best intentions, but sitting me down and saying to me, you know that you have to be strong now for the girls, meaning my sisters and my mum. And this is something that stuck with me from that day up until now, really. Um, 18 years later, this is something that has stuck with me. Um, and it's not um, uncommon for men to kind of have this sort of feeling, I need to be strong. I need to be the one who looks after my family. I can't speak about how I feel because that's weak. This, the sentiment behind this statement sticks with a lot of men, a lot of people um, in general. This is another one, uh, again, said to me as uh, a child, really, you're the man of the house now, you know. So these statements kind of reinforce that idea that, uh, well, I can't, I can't break down. I can't ask anyone for help. I can't be weak. Um, I can't um, show emotions because these are all things that I shouldn't be doing as a man. I need to be there for the women in my life. Now, I know that that's completely outdated and completely untrue, but these are things that are really kind of drilled into to me as a, as a young boy. The final one, which is probably a personal favourite of mine, um, give up, stop being so soft. Now, I don't know if being soft is, um, I, I don't know if it's maybe like a Northern England term specifically, but what this basically means is stop being such a wimp. Or what you might have heard it as uh, man up, which the phrase man up immediately just needs to get in the bin. It's, it's, it's one of the worst things um, anyone can ever say in this sort of situation. Sorry, I'm being harassed by my cat in case anyone couldn't guess. Here she is. So kind of 2017, comes around, so around four years ago now, I had been dealing with these internalized issues for the best part of uh, around 14 years or so at this point, really. Um, 
kind of cemented knowledge in my brain that you shouldn't speak to anyone about these. You certainly shouldn't mention to anyone that you're struggling or that you're upset or anxious. I wouldn't have even known kind of what anxiety was uh, at the time. And I wanted to kind of show this picture in particular, um, not just to kind of show off uh, my amazing mum who's in the picture, but I think this is important because all too often you kind of hear people say, you know, when someone's spoken out about dealing with a mental health issue or when someone um, speaks out and asks for help or when, you know, you read a story around someone who may have taken their own life, you'll often hear people say, well, you'll have never guessed they were struggling. You would have never guessed that uh, they needed help. They were the life and soul of the party. They were always smiling. You'll often hear these kinds of things, um, which aren't wrong things to say. They're certainly not bad, but I think it's, it shows how good a job people who are struggling can often do of, of hiding their emotions. So this is me around 2017, I think, um, it's certainly around the time that I was kind of really struggling with my anxiety. Generally speaking, um, I was generally pretty happy, uh, which sounds completely counterintuitive. How can you be battling serious stress and anxiety, but also be happy? But I was, um, they, they can sometimes coexist. Um, I generally had a pretty good life. Um, I was living in a nice flat in Leeds. I had good friends and family around me. I had a decent job. Nevertheless, I was a complete anxious wreck. Uh, so kind of behind this picture, you've got a whole host of physical anxiety symptoms. And by that, I mean um, things like digestive issues and IBS, which I know are not glamorous. I'm sorry, maybe TMI, but they affect a lot of us. Um, serious kind of issues with my stomach, which was kind of affecting the way I was eating. Um, I had kind of whole body aches and pains, muscular pain from being so tense all the time, frequently getting headaches and migraines, um, nail biting to the extreme, to the point where I would often not have fingernails um, and biting around them. And um, so this is what I mean by physical symptoms that can come with anxiety. On top of that, I had some serious issues with my sleep. I was averaging maybe two to four hours of sleep per night consistently, not just as, as a one-off, to kind of months on end, really. Inevitably, that was kind of leading to a complete lack of focus. So within work, uh, what I do in PR, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but like many things, it's very, very deadline driven. You're driven by deadlines from journalists, from clients internally. I could sit and know that I had a deadline coming up within hours and know that I had to get that work done, but just physically not be able to apply my brain to do the work. That's the level of kind of lack of focus that I would experience. There's also the constant nervous feeling, constant feeling of dread, that sort of real guttural pit of the stomach dread feeling. Um, I don't know how else to describe it for anyone else who's, who's never really felt this before, but it's that feeling when you know something really bad is going to happen or that feeling of um, if you're about to say go do a talk, ironically, in front of a load of people, it's that feeling you get in your stomach of, oh God, something bad's going to happen. It's that, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week <laughs> to the extreme, constantly believing that something bad is going to happen. And if something good was happening, I was believing that, well, this isn't gonna last for long because something bad is gonna come along to even out the scales. I also had some serious mood swings as well. And I think this is often something that goes um, kind of under the radar when people talk about anxiety. Um, I wasn't a nice person to be around. I don't take any real pride in saying that, but when I was at my worst, I could be really quite mean. Um, I could go from being happy and jolly and fairly content with life to, um, really quite angry or quite apathetic, not wanting to get out of bed for, for days on end, not wanting to look after myself, certainly not doing any kind of self-care. And then I could fling just as quickly from that into a fit of rage or uh, sulking over something. I also had some real anger and stress issues as well. I had a real short fuse, short patience. Um, I kind of, things would really, really uh, tip me over the edge quite 
quickly and there could be really really trivial things as well which inevitably cause some issues in my relationship my boyfriend and I would argue quite frequently if I had uh, thrown a sulk over something in his mind that was trivial uh, but these were all things that I was going through knew I was going through but still at this point was refusing to speak out to, to anyone about never mind kind of seek help and I think there were two stories here that I just want to kind of talk through because the two stories for me that really um, stick out in my brain as two illustrations of how ridiculous anxiety can be at times and by ridiculous I mean how much anxiety can convince your brain that something is really bad when in fact it's quite trivial. The first one is in my previous job um, we had a bin store which was around the corner from the office I'm laughing just saying this now because to say it out loud seems like ridiculous but at the time this was a real trigger for me so bear with me um, there was one day where I had accidentally taken home the keys to this bin store completely not an issue at all we had gone home to my flat in Leeds I had then gone from my flat in Leeds and got on the train to go and stay at my mum's for that night with my boyfriend everything was completely fine we were sat kind of chilling watching telly generally in a pretty good mood nothing to really stress about all of a sudden, almost like the flip of a switch, I realised, oh God, I don't have the bin keys on me. And from there on in, it was a very, very sharp downward spiral. I completely tipped my mum's house upside down, searching for these keys um, that I thought I'd lost. My sister and my boyfriend were doing the same thing. I was yelling at them both. I was on the brink of tears. I was shaking, sweating. My heart was pounding. Um, we searched for them for probably about an hour and then I left the house to walk back to the train station at night to retrace my steps, make sure I hadn't dropped them. I eventually got back on the train to Leeds, which is probably about 20, 25 minute journey back to Leeds and walked up to my flat because I just had to find these keys. Now, looking back at that now, I, I love like I just have done because it's a set of keys, right? It's a set of keys to the bin store. There were spares. And what was going to happen if I had lost them? I would have maybe got a bit of a slapped wrist. And that's literally it. In my mind at the time, I was convinced that if I went into work the next day and said, I've lost the keys to the bin store, I would lose my job on the spot. That's, I was genuinely convinced that that would happen. I was convinced that everyone would think oh, I'm stupid. I was convinced all of my colleagues would think I was completely ridiculous. Um, I was convinced myself that I was stupid for, for doing it. Um, nevertheless, you, you know, this was a, a huge kind of issue for me and it sent me on a downward spiral for the best part of probably a few weeks, maybe a couple of months um, after this happened. Now the other story is potentially even more ridiculous and you're probably going to laugh even more at this but it centers around baking which i cannot do but that doesn't stop me trying to trying to, to bake every so often um now what had happened was i was feeling a bit stressed i was feeling a little bit anxious i thought i will give baking a go i heard it's supposed to be relaxing it's supposed to be super calm Maybe I can channel my anxiety into something that's really productive and make something delicious at the same time, right? No, completely wrong um, for me anyway. So I decided I wanted to make this amazing chocolate tart that I'd made before um, and not done a terrible job of it previously. I spent probably around two hours uh, trying to make it, um, got it out of the oven when it was supposed to be ready and the whole thing fell apart. The whole thing crumbled, there was molten chocolate everywhere, I burnt my hand, there was pastry all over the floor. Just think about like the worst bake-off carnage you've seen <laughs> times 10, that was me. Um, and again, I'm laughing just thinking about it because it is just so ridiculous, isn't it? Like, oh, so what, you got something wrong when you were baking, like really not the end of the world. To me, those keys and that failed bake were kind of every worst thought I'd had about myself and every thought I had had about something that could go wrong, every time I told myself I wasn't good enough, those two things were manifestations of that. They were saying, well, I told you you weren't good enough. 
I, I told you you couldn't do this. I told you you were incapable. I told you you were stupid. It was all of those things being confirmed back to me in my brain. From that failed bake, I spent probably another two months on a complete downward spiral with my anxiety. I couldn't get anything done at work. I was massively underperforming, wasn't hitting deadlines. My, the quality of my work was poor, which was inevitably causing more stress because I was missing deadlines. <laughs> I was getting pressure from those above me naturally because I wasn't performing to the best of my ability. It was causing me problems in my relationship because I was kind of going back to these mood swings and these feelings of dread and nervousness and anger and kind of really kind of hating myself is the only word for it. I know that sounds strong, but that's kind of the only word there is for it. And it sounds silly that all of that could come from getting something wrong when you're trying to bake. But what I'm trying to say is anxiety can take the most trivial of thoughts in your brain and mould them into something that is all consuming and all encompassing. And it crafts them into something that your brain says to you, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you in the world. In reality, in you know, rational thinking, we know that that's not true. Of course it's not. But anxiety is the lack of rational thinking. Anxiety is irrational. And I think that's really important for anyone who does have anxiety or just anxious thoughts, or even if you just get a little bit stressed from time to time, it's very, very important to remember that stress and anxiety and, and depression and everything that kind of sits under the mental health umbrella is irrational. It's not rational thinking. There are ways that you can restore a bit of rational thinking to help take some control. But when you're in that moment, don't beat yourself up for feeling a bit silly feeling a bit stupid because your brain is taking control and your brain is really screwing you over quite frankly so i think that's something that's really important to remember next time you're feeling stressed just picture me completely flailing around with a broken chocolate tart and it will remind you that anxiety isn't rational so then this was me probably at, at maybe at my worst or kind of in one of my definite lower peaks from here i knew i needed to get help I knew I needed to talk to somebody. I kind of started to understand what was going on in that you have anxiety. This is not healthy. Even still, it took me about a year from this point to reach out and get help. Again, this is really important to bear in mind. Knowing that you need help and getting the help are two very different things. Um, often it doesn't just happen overnight like that. Um, I knew I needed that help, but the idea of going to get it was still completely terrifying. And it took me a year to build up that courage. So if you're thinking that maybe you need help, if you've considered therapy, or if a friend of yours has maybe spoken to you, please don't underestimate the level of courage and bravery that it takes to take those first steps. It is huge. If that's something you're doing right now, props to you. I'm incredibly proud of you. I reached out to a therapist and I cancelled my first two or three sessions very very last minute I'm surprised she ever took me on because ironically I was too anxious to go to I really want to hammer that home so that kind of takes us on to therapy and, and my experiences with therapy and what I've kind of learned along the way that I can hopefully impart and kind of talk you through what you might be able to expect so I guess right off the bat, I want to throw in a huge caveat in that I am not a trained mental health professional beyond um, a college course that I'm kind of trying to do part time at the moment. By no means am I a, a therapist, a psychotherapist, a counsellor. I am none of those things. All I can do and all I do is talk about my from it. Now, therapy is something of an umbrella term. Um, it's very important to kind of understand that, I guess. Um, there are various types of talking therapies that sit under the therapy umbrella. The three that I'm going to kind of chat through now are three that I have lived experience with. If therapy is something you're interested in, I would encourage you to do a bit of research around the different types that there are, um, because 
there are different types for different issues, for different personalities. It's about finding something that fits for you. So my therapy, um, some of it was CBT, which some of you may have heard of, some of you may not have heard of, some of you might have heard of it and know exactly what it is. Some of you might have heard of it, but you don't have a clue. Some of you may have just never heard of it. All of the above are fine. So CBT is Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. So this type of therapy focuses on the way that you behave and your thought patterns um, and your kind of habits, I guess, your habits and behaviours. It's relatively short term. Um, by that, I mean, you'll have kind of a set number of sessions before your therapist kind of sends you out into the big bad world to kind of practice what you've learned. You will usually set some goals and then work with your therapist to achieve them. You'll often have tasks, kind of like a homework to carry out. That might be some journaling. It might be some CBT exercises to carry out. Um, and there are also tons of CBT resources to try online. Um, literally just search CBT templates. There are tons of free downloads that you can try. CBT is fantastic. Um, I swear by CBT. There are exercises that I learned in therapy that I use to this day, some of which I'll go through with you shortly. What CBT doesn't do um, is it doesn't necessarily address the root cause of what's making you anxious. That's where we get on to things like uh, interpersonal therapy, uh, which formed kind of another part of my therapy experience. So interpersonal therapy or IPT centers around how your relationships with others uh, kind of within your network affect your life. So it kind of focuses on this idea that poor relationships with people in your life can cause issues that lead to depression and anxiety. So you work with your therapist to identify and address problems with your friends or your family members, maybe colleagues, partners. Um, so when I say relationships, I don't just mean romantic relationships, kind of your whole network, so to speak. You work through kind of who they are, how they link with you, and how those relationships are affecting your life and then you work through what you can do to start to resolve any issues to sort of strengthen relationships to uh, to benefit you and to work through problems the third and final one that i'm going to chat through is person-centered or humanistic therapies there's a humanistic approach within that six person-centered therapy this is predominantly what I did as part of my therapy journey. This is predominantly what my sessions focused on. Now, person-centered, the person-centered or humanistic approach focuses on um, you and how you perceive yourself and your beliefs and your thoughts. Um, it's often used to deal with life events, um, particularly life events that might be blocking you from realizing your potential. It, kind of centers around this idea that we all have this full potential um, and there are thought patterns and events and blockages that can stop you from reaching that potential sometimes. You work with your therapist, it's very much a two-way street to um, basically have conversations really to understand issues and events and for your therapist to gain an understanding from your perspective so that you can kind of work together to reach solutions um, and kind of uncover truths and perspectives and kind of issues throughout your life that have impacted where you are right now. The thing about this type of therapy that I love uh, in particular is that it allows you to explore your own strengths and your own identity to reach those solutions. Um, and what I mean by that is um, the, the main thing I learned when uh, I kind of finished therapy was that no one had handed me anything and said, here you go, here's what you need to solve this. Or no one had necessarily taught me anything new. I learned some exercises along the way, but no one had given me anything that was, you know, uh, new or, or, or different to me. All I had done was pull out what was within me and pull out beliefs and, and thoughts and behaviours that I had within me and within my mind that I just kind of wasn't really using because there were various blockages that stood in the way. They'll often describe person-centred therapy as a therapist holding up a mirror to you and you kind of talking to that and they reflect it back to you to kind of give you a different perspective on things, to almost coach you into reaching solutions yourself. It can really help to kind of 
uncover deep rooted issues and get solutions in place that can kind of last for a long time. So those are kind of the three types of therapy um, I have direct experience with. Like I said, there's tons of others. So if you're interested, I would really recommend doing some research. I've got some kind of resources at the end that I can chat you through. Um, but those are the three that I can kind of confidently chat around. What I want to do now um, is go through three exercises. I promise you there is going to be no asking people to share an interesting fact about themselves, none of that. It's completely up to you if you want to get involved. I can't see any of you anyway, so you could be doing anything at this point and who would know? But I do encourage you to give it a try um, if, if you feel up to it. So you just need to grab either a, a pen and paper if you've got one handy um, or something that you can write or draw on. Uh, it could just be your phone, um, I'm really not too fussy. Something where you can kind of write down some thoughts would be ideal. Not essential, you can just think it through, but I often think it helps to have something down that you can kind of read back. So um, if you need to go and grab something now, feel free. I'm gonna take a breath and a drink of water so you've got some time to go and grab something. Okay, time's up. You've had enough time to go and grab something. So the first exercise that I want to chat through is the circle of influence, or you might sometimes hear this called the circle of control as well. Um, this is, for me, um, one of the most effective tools at managing, um, at managing my anxiety. I have a real anxiety about the world. Um, I have I often get into panics about the world ending uh, and about us going to war so you can imagine the past year and a bit uh, with pandemic news hasn't been the best time for me in my brain as I'm sure is the case for so many other people the circle of influence is great at tackling that type of thing I appreciate you probably can't see the writing that's on this slide um, you'll see in a second why I've not attempted to draw my own version of this but Basically, the circle of influence helps you to identify things that are beyond your control and things that are within your control, but you can focus on the ones that are within your control and create actions to help you gain control of those and to help you make positive changes. So right in the center there, in the white circle, you've got everything that's within your control. So that's your thoughts, uh, words, your actions and behaviors, your reactions, uh, your decisions and choices, your attitude, your mindset, uh, your mood and your work ethic, just a few kind of examples. The outer circle, the, the blue circle on the outside of that um, is the circle of um, influence. So these are all things that you can't control directly, but you can influence what happens. So these are things like other people's actions, other people's thoughts or choices, um, who follows you on social media, your reputation, whether you get promoted at work, uh, how much your partner loves you, how much your friends like you, your children's future, um, all those kinds of things that you can't control, but you can have some impact on, or some influence on, I should say. The outer circle, this grey circle all around the outside, are all things that no matter how hard you try, you can't control. You cannot control what is going to happen with the things that sit within this circle. So there is no point expending your energy in trying to solve them or in worrying about them because it isn't going to resolve anything. I know that sounds harsh, but trust me, it's good for you. <laughs> so these are all things such as uh, the weather, uh, world peace, the threat of war, government policy, death, traffic, the economy, uh, the pandemic, very quite relevant at the moment, obviously, uh, things like cyber threats, um, strangers' comments on public forums, celebrity behaviour, how much stock a retailer might have, what the traffic's like, the media. You can't control any of these things. So if you're putting your energy into stressing and worrying about these things, you're going to burn out. You're going to tie yourself out. You're going to get caught up in a spiral of anxiety. Now, I'll give you kind of a few seconds just to have a think about maybe something, um, something you've been feeling particularly anxious about or worried about. And then we'll just chat through uh, an example um, that's personal to me to kind of show you this in practice, really. I'll just give you a couple of seconds. Like I said, have a bit of a think. What's something that you've been a bit worried about or something that 
you know sends you into a bit of an anxious spiral. What are some of the things to do with that that you can control? What are some of the things that you can influence? And what are all of the things related to that worry that are completely out of your control? I'm standing here hoping my cat doesn't come in and harass me again. So sorry to anyone who heard her meowing like a feral beast at the beginning. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't come back. Cool. So don't worry if you're not finished. It is completely fine. Um, you can either keep going, you can stop and, and kind of tune back in or feel free to pick it up kind of after you've finished. But this is kind of how this works for me in practice, I suppose, just as an example, this isn't the, uh, the only worry I have, but this is, I guess, my main worry at the moment, as with probably so many other people. Um, and that's the pandemic, this wild time that we found ourselves in for the past 12 months. Even pre pandemic, I was terrified about the end of the world and an outbreak like this, which maybe I was right to think, maybe I'm psychic, who knows. Um, so What's within my control when it comes to the pandemic? What can I control that is going to help me to not be so anxious? Well, I can control what media I choose to look at. So I made a decision fairly swiftly to stop um, watching the Prime Minister's announcements um, in the UK when we were having these daily, when we very first locked down this time last year. I made a decision probably a couple of weeks into lockdown I didn't want to watch those anymore. I made a decision to stop watching the rolling news, to stop checking the numbers. I unfollowed every news outlet on Twitter um, and on all of my social channels so that I could control what news I was taking in and when. Um, I can control my social media usage. So I knew that social media was sending me into a real anxious hole. It was making me feel a million times worse than I needed to. There was so many people talking about whether to wear masks or not, whether it was fake and sharing articles, we've all seen it. That was no good for me. So my action was fine. I'm gonna delete these apps from my phone. I installed an app that controlled how much time I could spend on them and it locked them when I'd had that time because I was very, very obsessed with Twitter. I still am, but I needed to control it at the time. And I also controlled who I was following. So if I saw accounts that I knew were consistently quite triggering for me, I either muted them or I unfollowed them. That almost immediately had a great kind of impact on me, a real positive impact. I could also control my behaviors and my reactions as well. So my behaviors, so things like making sure I was following the government guidelines when I was going out shopping, making sure I was keeping my distance, I had my mask on, I was washing my hands when I got in and I was doing everything I could to be safe. And my reactions as well, you know, if someone was uh, not keeping the distance from me. It was not getting myself so stressed out about it or lashing out at them. It was removing myself from those situations. So um, I'm asthmatic as well. So I was at a fair bit of risk. So I started to get deliveries for the first few weeks of the lockdown. I made the decision to not go to the supermarket because it was really, really quite damaging to me. And I was getting to a, a really, really bad place to the point where I was obsessively cleaning. I was obsessively washing all the worst things. So all of these things I could control. So the things that you can control, you take them and you develop actions off the back of them. They're all things that you can do right now or in the next few days to um, have a positive impact on your life. The circle of influence. Now I can't control what other people do, what my friends and family were doing, but I can influence them. So I spoke to my friends and my family and I said, hey, you doing this is making me feel really anxious. If you're going to the shops, please, can you make sure you keep your distance from people? This is really, really making me worried. Can you stop doing that thing that you're doing? Having those conversations, I can't control whether they do that or not. Ultimately, I don't know whether they did do it or not, but I could influence them, hopefully. Um, work, so I was very, very worried that I was going to be losing my job. I can't control that. I can't control my company's massive. I single-handedly can't control how much money we were making and how many clients chose to leave us. What I could do is focus on my job and my 
uh, my kind of cog in the machine, so to speak, to make sure I was doing that well, doing it to the best of my ability, um, so that we were still delivering great work for our clients. Um, friends and family's thoughts, similarly to their kind of actions and behaviours, I can't control what they think, but I can speak to them and let them know what my worries were. Government decisions as well, I can't control government policy, I couldn't control how they manage lockdown, I could influence some of the decisions that they had made, I wrote a few different to my local MPs on various issues. Um, I can't, but I knew I could influence it. So again, it gave me some action that were kind of tangible that I could focus my efforts on to stop me getting caught up in all of these things in the outside that were beyond my control. I can't control how coronavirus spreads. I can't control the hospital numbers and the number of people who passed away from coronavirus. I can't control what the government does. Couldn't control if I was gonna be made redundant or not. I, I wasn't, thankfully but it was completely out of my control and I can't, I can't control death, unfortunately. Um, so that gives you an idea of how to focus your energy if you're worried about things that aren't within your control. Focus on the center and the out the middle circle and create actions from those things. That will give you a real tangible list that you can focus on, you can focus your energy on, and it will just stop you getting caught up in the million and one things, the million and one what ifs that exist outside of that circle because there's no point there is no point worrying about things that are so far beyond your control because you'll just wear yourself out there's a, an interesting song you might have heard it um the sunscreen song and within it it says you can worry but know that worrying is as as effective as trying to solve an algebra equation equation by chewing bubble gum worrying about things you can't control is pointless so focus on the things you can control create actions to affect positive change in your life. Now, this next one um, is the vicious flower or the virtuous flower. I'll talk you through both. Now, this focuses on, you'll be grateful I've not tried to draw my own flower here, but this focuses on beliefs, um, our beliefs and the things and the habits and the behaviours that we have that enforce these beliefs. So you start with right in the center there in that circle, identifying a, uh, a, a belief. Let's start with a negative belief. Let's start with the vicious flower. So a negative belief. Once you've got that down, start to write around the outside. Don't draw your, your petals just yet, but you start to write around the outside uh, any behaviors um, or kind of habits or actions that you do that prevent that belief from coming true or that you do to protect yourself from any potential consequences of that belief. Again, I'll talk you through an example for me in a second, which if this isn't making sense, hopefully it will kind of start to, uh, start to come together. Now, once you've got those kind of behaviors around the outside, you might start to realize that a lot of these things are perhaps inadvertently um, reinforcing the belief that's in the center often we'll have a negative thought and our habits and our behaviors are just feeding into that and strengthening it. So have a read around some of the things you've maybe written around the outside um, and think about the consequences of those things. Are they actually feeding into this negative thought? If they are, start to draw your petal around them with an arrow coming back to the center. Each of these petals then serves as a behavior that you can work on, um, ideally kind of with a professional, with a therapist, and you can work on addressing this specific behavior to pluck that petal from the flower. Eventually you have none left, and hopefully you've kind of swapped out all of these negative behavior patterns for positive ones that enforce more positive change in your life. So just some examples in the middle, you might put something like, I'm completely unlovable. Um, I, I'm not worthy of a relationship, for example around the outside, it might be that you push people away, it might be that you become quite controlling when you're in a relationship, it might be that you avoid relationships altogether, um, various thoughts like that, they will inevitably feed into this idea, well, I'm unlovable then. You know, people keep leaving me, that must mean I'm unlovable, but really, it, these behaviours that you're doing in pushing people away are potentially causing that, but it's reinforcing this, this you have so it's the never-ending cycle until you tackle the actions you might have something like i can't do this job i'm not smart enough people don't like me there's kind of endless possibilities for this one for me personally one thing that i worked through was 
which hopefully, well, not hopefully, that's completely the wrong word. I was going to say hopefully people relate to. I hope you don't relate to not being good enough. Um, but I think people will maybe relate to that, you know, this idea of I'm not good enough. Um, I deal with imposter syndrome a lot. Um, so I have this idea of I'm not good enough for this job in my central uh, circle. I don't know biology, so I don't know what's actually called on the flower. Sorry if there are any biologists watching. So some of my behaviours are things like uh, procrastination. Uh, oh, been harassed on a cat. Procrastination, <laughs> um, avoidance. Um, sorry, procrastination and avoidance, and putting things off. Perfectionism, um, all of those types of things, so that I don't have to realize that I'm not good enough so that I can say well you know I, I, I never did it so I never found out if I was good enough or not they're very negative patterns um they're not kind of there's no way to live so it's starting to work out why I'm feeling those things so that I can address the central issue you can also flip this on this on its head and look at what's called the virtuous flower which can be really 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 empowering and impactful and that's basically the complete opposite. Um, you write in the center something that you aspire to, um, almost a, a positive belief that you want to have, um, or positive behavior that you want to kind of enforce in your life. Um, and you guessed it, kind of do the opposite. So around the outside, you write the positive thoughts and behaviors that you can start to put into practice that will reinforce this uh, positive belief. So that might be, I am good enough. And what are some of the behaviours you can do that will prove to you that you are good enough? That might be trying new things, you know, giving something a go, speaking to someone more knowledgeable than you who can help you to, to learn new things. And then finally, um, before this feral cat trashes my entire desk, we've got the five, four, three, two, one coping technique. So this is kind of centered around the five senses um, as a way of grounding you in the present moment. So you'll often hear that anxiety is kind of an obsession with the future. It's living in the future. It's living in uh, sort of hypothetical what ifs, you know, what, what if this goes wrong? What if I do it and I'm bad at it? What if I lose my job? What if people don't like this? It's that never ending question of what if that at an extreme level starts to cause anxiety. One way to tackle that quite immediately is grounding yourself back in the present moment. You'll hear a lot of this in um, yoga practice. I know there's been some yoga sessions as part of this festival. Um, so if any of you went to that, you may have heard a lot of talk around grounding yourself in the present. Um, we do a lot of breathing techniques to do exactly this. So the five, four, three, two, one coping technique uses your five senses. So I'm gonna just talk you through it now. Choose to follow me um, or not, obviously. Again, I can't see if you are, so, uh, but I do encourage you to give it a go. So first of all, just take a deep breath, just to kind of settle, uh, settle, settle your mind a little bit. So just a real deep inhale and then breathe it all out, breathe out all the bad stuff. So you start by acknowledging five things that you can see right now around you. That might be a pen, it might be a spot on the wall, it could be me, it could be Lulu the cat, it could be something in your garden. Five things that you can see. What are four things that you can feel or touch around you? It might be the feeling of your clothes and your skin right now, could be the feeling of your breath as it moves in and out of your mouth. It might be the glasses sat on the bridge of your nose. It could be the air moving in and out of the room. Now acknowledge three things that you can hear. That might be my voice. It might be your computer. There might be some music on. Maybe you can hear the TV in the other room. Now acknowledge two things that you can smell. Maybe your dinner's cooking, maybe it's your perfume or aftershave. It could be fresh air, it could be something outside coming through the window. And now acknowledge one thing that you can taste. And just take another deep breath and let that settle. So 
So this one, like I said, is particularly good for kind of an immediate fix. Um, you can do it as many times as you want, um, but it is great for kind of immediately grounding you down uh, in the present moment. So now what? Uh, we've kind of come to the end or we're approaching the end. The only thing I can ask of you really, the only kind of takeaway that I want you all to take from this is to keep talking. Um, keep talking to each other, uh, maybe to yourselves. Go away and tell people about this presentation. Tell people about my feral cat who leapt on the desk and sent everything flying. Tell people how you felt or some things that you learned. Write things down and um, do a bit of journaling. Just keep talking. Like I said, right at the start, talking and conversation is the best weapon we have at completely getting rid of the stigma surrounding mental health. There's also some really helpful resources. There's so, so much stuff out there now, um, but I've tried to limit this. Uh, Mind, a charity in the UK, they have so many helpful resources on living with mental illness, helping others, medication, what your legal rights are, and so, so much more. Check them out. Um, BACP, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's the British Association of Chartered Psychotherapists. I'm sorry if that's wrong, but it's a good guess, right? This is where I found my therapist. It's basically a, a register of, of, of all the licensed uh, and accredited therapists. Uh, Andy's Man Club, again, is UK based, but they host regional talking groups for men um, online and when they're allowed to do them in person, they do in person as well. Mind Journal is the journal, uh, it's the journal that I use. We've not touched on journaling. Um, it's probably a whole other se session um, on how to sort of journal, um, but these are great. Uh, they're kind of designed by men and with men in mind to help you start to talk more openly about emotions, which as men, typically, we're not very good at. And then Think CBT is a whole host of um, free to download CBT templates uh, that you can take a look at and try, similar to the ones we've worked through today, but there's just an endless bank of them. That is it. I will take a deep breath now. Um, if there are any questions, I am more than willing to hopefully answer them. We've got a little bit of time left. Or I'm going to hang around in the little networking bit afterwards. Or if you just want to grab me on socials, there I am on Instagram or Twitter. So if you want to grab me on those, um, I'm all ears. But that's everything. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully you've taken something helpful away from that. If not, at least you got to see a cat. So happy Sunday. Thanks, everyone.